the Before Her Time singer-songwriter Laura Nero and her 1968 album Eli and the 13th Confession. The album was her second and featured songs that she debuted at the 1967 Monterey Pop Festival. The album is considered Nero's most accessible and famous work, and David Letterman band leader Paul Schaefer listed the album as his Desert Island record. Bonus stacks today. <laughs> Bonus coming the stacks. We are here to cover the album by Laura Nero, 1968, Eli and the 13th Confession. Guys, are you excited about this one? You know it. You I know thought it. it was Laura Nero. Laura, nope, Ni it's, I, I, it's, it's Laura Nero, Nero for sure. Yep, yeah, it's definitely Nero. This is one of my mom's all time favorite singer songwriters. So I, I know can, this. I totally well. understand that after yep. listening to this album you got it so we're gonna have a lot to talk about it sounds like uh for those once again you've been listening but this is once again a no longer than 15 minute review of an album hot take uh, excuse me hot take off a cold listen so in other words we are just listening to this not doing any bio and just giving our initial thoughts so we're gonna go ahead i'm setting it up right now we're gonna set the clock up are you guys ready to begin? And probably we'll start with Josh for his take on this. Ready, set, go. Okay. Josh, I, thoughts? The, yeah, the first, I had never heard of her before. I mean, I've heard of her, hmm. but never heard her music. And um, the first thing right off the bat is you get a very strong voice from her. Um, very clear, very, um, she's able, she has a, a big range based on um, what I heard. And... I was not expecting it to be the album to be so up tempo and almost like jazzy or Motown or like a lounge singer almost. Um, I was expecting more like Joan Baez or something. I thought it was going to get a lot of like protest um, kind of low. Um, well, she was protesting range. some things just different. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, feminist things for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, and I thought the album was as a whole was very um enjoyable there's some uh very strong production i liked the i guess it was like her singing against herself in a lot of the songs or unless she had backup singers um i noticed that and um a lot of horns and i liked the thematic content um i don't think we had heard anything like that before i mean we're incorporating more more female voices into um our repertoire of, of albums and i really liked uh what she had to say and the way she sang it gotcha matt your thoughts so i had initial i had, I had no idea who this was never heard of her never heard any really? of the songs no clue yeah wow. um okay so brand spanking new um and the first thing that stuck out to me was the structure of a lot of the songs. There's a lot of, it's, it's very interesting because you think you kind of know what a song might be doing and then all of a sudden it stops, it changes mm -hmm. the tempo, it mm -hmm. changes the key signature. Um, and maybe it does even a different melody. And that's pretty much present throughout the whole album. And uh, so I, I think I liked it overall. I don't, it seemed, it seemed at some points maybe a little busy it was almost doing that too much, but overall, mm -hmm. I, I don't think I don't, at the end of the day, I don't think on my first listen, I think that it was too much. Um, I'm seeing, I do agree with Josh. I think she's got a good voice. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm getting a cross between maybe some of the stuff that we heard with Dusty Springfield. Um, some of the stuff that we, we heard with not necessarily with the voice, but some of the, you know, the orchestration and the production um, and, and the tempo with stuff like Aretha Franklin. Um, you know, you definitely get like the R&B soul aspect here. There's some funky songs going, funky aspects of this as well. Mm -hmm. um, there's a there's a really cool guitar part that I think in my favorite track was uh, one of the uh, last tracks, Woman's Blues. There's a really cool guitar part in there. It kind of breaks mm -hmm. into a little bit of a funk groove, which um, kind of came out of nowhere. I thought that that was interesting. Uh, yeah, definitely with Josh, I agree. There's like a lounge singer aspect of this. It's kind of, you know, some of this is a slower jazzy or kind of, you know, late night bar, you know, smoky atmosphere and um, lots of strings, lots of, you know, high production, lots of percussion instruments. There's like harps and timpani and 
flutes and horns and you know mm-hmm. all kinds of different percussion instruments here so uh, a lot of things going on and i think overall it was enjoyable it's a lot of bouncy songs very catchy kind of like bouncy um happy sounding songs there's a couple of slower more melancholy songs uh particularly with the penultimate track december's boudoir was a very was might have been the most chill song on the record but um, overall, I liked it. It's it, this is not my you know wheelhouse, I guess, with with music. But um, I'm starting to like the sound a little bit more, you know, with that kind of like 70s. I know this is like late 60s, but I'm, I, I hear more of like a 70s orchestration production behind it, um, and I'm I'm liking that more than I probably did nine ten months ago when we started doing this. Um, mm-hmm. Just getting a little bit more used to it. So um, overall, but very good, interesting, almost proggy in that regard too, with all the changes and stuff in the uh, structures and tempos and stuff like that. So um, so that was what I was probably that was the aspect that I took away most from this. So I I look at this as a as an interesting gap between the sixties and seventies because this is definitively blue eyed soul. Um, it is not Dusty Brink- Springfield. Uh, Blue Eyed Soul. It's from a different standard, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, when I hear Le- Laura Nero, and I, I, I am familiar with Laura Nero quite a bit um, from multiple members of my family who love her, but uh, she has a very New York sound to me. Um, in some ways, I actually think while they don't sound alike, she in a female way sort of has the same vibe that Billy Joel has in the 70s and the 80s, okay. and that she writes these bouncy songs that sort of are slice of life, um, a just almost feel like they're set in New York. Um, and so like, I always think, and, and I know Laura Nero is from New York. So it, it has a real New York feel to me. It also, um, it bridges that late sixties blue eyed soul into the set, what the seventies would become with um, like Carly Simon and different people. There's, yeah, there's a definitely. lot of people who really owe a debt to Laura Nero because she sort of created this sound, which very much sounds like the 1970s, like Matt said, um, the type of singer songwriter that comes from the 70s all the way down to lyrical content. And, and you know, Josh and I touched on it a little bit, but this is a strongly feminist record, especially for its time. If you listen to the lyrics on this album, um, it's independent feminism, too. Um, and I think that's what stands out to me. It is. It's love songs, but it's love songs written by women who want love but don't need love. And that's where it's very different than the 60s, right? Because the 60s was sort of like, I'm not complete without, you know, my significant other, right? This sort of is the prototype for, you know, the 1970s, you know, Linda Ronstadt, Carly Simon. There's a bunch of different artists that... that have a real debt to Laura Nero that come later. Even even you know later like the Tori Amoses of the world and yeah, stuff. Kate that's Bush not or a, something. Kate Bush. Yeah, there's there's not a large uh, Suzanne Vega. There's a, you know there's not a large uh, you know jump from what she's doing here to what they're doing. They kind of expand on that template. So that's what I would say there. The orchestration is um, it's definitely piano driven. There are times where. Um, Strings, as Matt said, comes in quite a bit, but also the drums. I like the songs where the drums are present quite a bit because it adds a little bit of um, texture to the to the verses. But uh, all in all, I, I knew this album very well, so I can't say it was like a brand new listen, but I've always liked this album. I like this album as sort of a harbinger of what's to come as well. Um, it's like much of the 60s. It's a little long. I think that it could have done with maybe, you know, three or four less tracks because after a while it starts to kind of you know, get a little mm-hmm. samey at points in terms of the arrangement. Mm-hmm. I would say the standout tracks for me are Eli's Coming, Stone Soul, Picnic. Um, and I, I actually, I love Women's Blues. Women's Blues is probably my favorite Laura Nero song. And then the Confession at the end, I really like quite a bit too. So those are probably the four that really stand out to me. Yeah, she brings a she brings a big energy to her singing. That's what I got from it with the, the way she changes keys. And like you said, the variety with all of the, she matches all the instrumentation that, that is on this production. Uh, mm-hmm. as opposed to it like enhancing her I, th- I feel like they're kind of one in the same um i i picked up on you know she writes about her or sings about her mother um or a mother in poverty train and mm-hmm. and um i also f- thought eli's coming in stone soul picnic were standouts for me i i also liked lonely women a lot that was a good song mm-hmm. and i can easily see myself incorporating um her music into to mixtapes or or exposing it to people who haven't heard it before. Yeah, I think sure. this would benefit for me for you know more listens because, like I said, because there's so much, so there's so many changes in so many of the different tracks that 
you know, um, it's hard, you know, for me, it's hard to kind of really get a grasp on the overall song um, when it does, when it switches stuff up like that. I do like that, uh, but I think it re requires a few more listens. But the, a lot of the areas were still very enjoyable. A lot of the different, you know, the sounds and stuff that she was doing and the mm -hmm. the upbeat nature. I agree with you, John. I think probably, you know, I, I think it could definitely do without a couple of the tracks on it, um, you know, but, uh, I, 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 but I don't feel like it was totally overstaying its welcome or anything like that. I think that we've definitely covered other albums and we're certainly going to cover other albums later on that I'm going to have a stronger feeling about that. Uh, but no, for having no, no clue about this at all, it was a, uh, yeah, I'm, uh, it was did, a good experience. Did you guys notice the way that Laura Nero sings, by the way, is like a staple of like 70s and 80s TV jingles and stuff like that. If you listen to theme songs and stuff mm, okay, of different shows, sense. have you yeah. noticed that like people spent the next 10 to 20 years trying to sing her style. Like think about different songs that you've heard from TV shows and commercials and stuff like that. So many people are trying to do the Laura Nero voice. You know what I mean? That expressive voice that is upbeat, but yet sends a message, you know, sends a message. It felt like there was a while on TV where every theme song was kind of trying to tell you the story of what the show is about, right? Mm -hmm. In a sketch and you know, like I said, it's it's impossible to think of many of the 70s singer songwriters without, you know, seeing, you know, her influence. But also, I, I know we haven't, I, I, I can't stress enough that to me, she is in some ways the female Billy Joel <laughs> in that, like, how she writes songs. If we were to go and listen to a Billy Joel album right now, I think it would really stick out in the sense that, you know, both piano driven compositions that lead to like big choruses, you know, soaring stuff where they're going up and down, you know, slice of life type stories. But does um, Billy Joel have the orc? I don't hear Billy Joel doing the orchestra. His arrangement like is his arrangement is different. And I'm not saying it's a direct correlation, but it's the, they're they're in the same lane, if that makes sense, in terms of the songs they're trying to write. Yeah, I guess I when I hear that orchestration, I mean, when, when you're talking about her voice and, you know, being incorporated into commercials and TV shows it to me, it's I hear I hear that more with like the orchestration is just really what stands out to me. That's where I get that that 70s sound. You know, that's when I feel like I'm, I'm hearing a song from like. I don't know, that was in the background during an episode of Chips or something like mm -hmm. that, you know, um, and and that's more of a testament of the production and the uh, and the overall orchestration, I would say to that. And that's why, I mean, I, I'm not disagreeing in terms of like the, the, the way that they approach their song writing with her and Billy Joel. But to me, it's a totally different thing because I don't hear I know a lot of Billy Joel stuff. I don't hear a lot of this overly this. I don't want to say overly produced, but very highly produced orchestration um, strings and things like that. I don't hear that as much as Billy Joel. So I, I, I wouldn't go there, but I, I'm listening to it differently, I guess. Um, so I can't, I can't argue with the way that you're comparing them in that regard. Does she play the piano on this album? Yes. You know? yep. Okay. Yes. She's a, she's a pianist, like singer pianist, you know, as gotcha. opposed to singer songwriter, Yeah. Stuff like that. She also, um, I don't know if you guys caught it. I, I know a little bit more of her bio than most, but did you guys catch the, um, the sexuality? Um, like, you know, she was pretty yes. notoriously bisexual in an era when that was not something that a lot of people sang about and her lyrics definitely covered that. I thought it was clever that the 13th song is called the confession. So if that's you the got title it. of the, yeah, uh, of the you album. You got it. Cover. So also, mm -hmm. I saw that she died young, unfortunately, of ovarian cancer. She did. Yeah, I think she, I don't know if she made 50, if I remember correctly. Yeah, 49. So. Same age as her mother. Wow. That's... Of, also of ovarian cancer. Yeah. Jeez. Well, any other final thoughts? We're at the 12, a little over the 12 minute mark, which is about when we ended up. This is uh, comes in at 130 on best ever albums in the 60s and 1247 overall. So this is... An, you said this made the Rolling Stone top 500, right? That's why we're doing it. Yeah, so that's quite off, but you know, but not too far off from the top of this. It's still it's our highly most highly regarded album um, at, mm -hmm. at 130 in the 60s. Um, I think so. well worth a listen if you like female singer songwriters yeah. too. I think yeah, definitely. I would, I would give a recommend. She's like a found. It seems like she would be a foundational one if you were going through the the chronology of of all those famous um, women. Well, you think about it, we haven't really covered many female singer songwriters no. in the 60s in our regular countdown. And then no, even with these not. bonus episodes, I mean, most of the female singers we've covered are African-American R&B and soul singers who were, you know, in their own right, incredible, but doing a different a different shtick, you know? So, um, you know, in the 70s, the countdown proliferates with female singer songwriters, but um, this is very much ahead of its time in that sense. Um, 
yeah, she was she was one of the few. Um, mm. It also doesn't you know, really sound, you know, of the '60s in a way. It's pretty. That's why I said it's, it's a '70s weird. album, is what yeah. it feels like to me. Yeah. There's no like psychedelia on here. There's no sort of folksy notes or you know uh, production. <laughs> well, John, no, it's there... like New York, New York City, but not Greenwich Village. You know, coffee shop, right. uh, mm -hmm. uh, New York City. More of like John... a walk in the streets, living in New York City, New York City. Was there was there any like psychedelic blue eyed soul? Was that ever a crossover at all? Those those genres don't really go together. You know <laughs> I was gonna I mean? say they that do, they does... do different things. Yeah, <laughs> that's so. your that's your new new album, Matt. <laughs> psychedelic blue eyed soul. <laughs> but it is. I mean, I'll I'll end with this. It definitely is blue eyed soul. Like for those that know, and and for those that are wondering what that is, it's basically just soul music sung by white people. Is basically mm. blue eyed soul. But um, you know, so she's got a lot of uh, soul in her voice, and um, definitely um, much like Dusty Springfield is clearly to some degree indebted to like early R&B and pop music but she does take it in a different direction than Dusty Springfield did who's more of a standard singer whereas Laura Nero was taking it in sort of like a postmodern feminist direction I think is where she was going with it mm -hmm. yeah I thought of that song Don't Mess With Bill by the Marvelettes at one point I think maybe mm. on like the second track there's just some sort of like intonations that reminded me of that type of yep. music I hear what you're saying for sure yeah so, all right, yeah, good. well, good stuff. I think everybody kind of liked it. We're rated about the 15 minute mark. So I think we're gonna put a bow on it right there. Lauren.